Madam Chair, we're now live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm local counselor of Ward 3, Lisa Bauer, and I will be your chair this afternoon. Due to the COVID-19 emergency declaration, this meeting of the General Government Committee is being held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council in attendance are participating by audio and video teleconference, and town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching from home, please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties throughout the meeting. I'll now call this meeting to order. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, I will move to item three of the agenda, the adoption of the minutes. We have the regular meeting minutes from October 12th. Are there any questions about those minutes? And may I have a mover, please? I see Regional Councillor Crawford. All in favor? Any opposed? It passes. And now the closed meeting uh, minutes from October 12th as well. Are there any questions? And a mover for that, please. I see Councillor Khan. All in favor? None opposed, thank you. The consent agenda, the following items have been pulled. 4.3, 4.6, 4.9, 4.10, and 4.11. May I please have a mover for the remaining items on the consent agenda? I see Regional Councillor Lee, all in favor? And none opposed, thank you. So we will go to item 4.3, please. The 2022 Municipal Election Compliance Audit Committee Terms of Reference. And the puller of that item is the mayor. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me bring my questions up here. Um, geez, election time again, wow. I, I just, wonder through you to the clerk, what provisions are gonna be put in place to um, vet the candidates to make sure we don't have people who have donated to campaigns, people who have run or are going to be running in campaigns, people who have expressed um, strong opinions about candidates on social media, that type of thing, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, through the chair, that's a really excellent question. So part of the reason we're proposing the model that we are where we participate in the regional roster is it'll just give us access to a broader candidate pool so that we can make sure um, that the candidates that we call upon to serve on the town's committee should we get a compliance audit uh, request won't be uh, tied to any candidate. And, and further to that, I'll just point you to, my goodness, this is a long agenda package, uh, page 491 of the agenda package. Uh, right at the bottom, it it, right in the terms of references, uh, the terms of reference for the committee, we've built in that all committee members have to agree in writing up front that they will not work or volunteer for or contribute to any candidate. Uh, and if they, they violate that commitment, then we simply just wouldn't choose that person from the roster to sit on the Ajax committee. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, those are my questions. I'm happy to move the item if you don't move yet, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mayor Collier. Are there any other questions on 4.3? Okay. Uh, moved by Mayor Collier. All in favor? None opposed. Thank you very much. The next item is 4.6, the updates to public notice policy. Uh, I had pulled that one. I just had a couple of questions about it. Thank you for that report. Um, why are we removing a requirement, so the printed notices, uh, when we know there are residents who are not internet reliant, either by circumstance or by preference. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll uh, take that question and, and through you. Uh, it's not so much that the new policy is removing the requirement uh, for printed notices, either in the newspaper or, or by localized mailer. Uh, it's actually just kind of expanding the scope of the policy to include a lot of situations that the current policy didn't cover. Uh, if, you, if you read the current policy and compare it, it, it only applies currently to matters that come before council uh, and sets a really kind of prescribed uh, sit, set of situations where we would publish notice. Uh, what's happening in reality is, of course, we have a number of different public consultation opportunities or things that affect the community. 
uh, and we're publishing those currently either online or in print or by local mailer. And there isn't really a policy framework currently that, that governs that. So what these changes to the policy do is kind of expand the scope to provide a bit of guidance to staff about uh, the situations when we might want to do uh, notice, not just online, but also by newspaper or by letter mail. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I appreciate that. And so what would be the determining factors then um, to decide when a written notice would be issued? For you, Madam Chair, so it would be kind of on a case by case basis. Uh, the new policy does set out um, some guidelines for staff to determine when public notice should be required. Uh, and just to give you an example of some of the things they might consider uh, could be the size of the population that's affected, the particular demographics, uh, the length of time that something might be occurring, uh, and the impact on residents overall. And when you start to look at those factors, you can start to think about uh, the kinds of situations where perhaps just online notice would suffice or where perhaps uh, a mailer to a specific geographic area might be appropriate or broad uh, notification through the local newspaper. So just to give you an example, um, we do a number of different uh, mailers, uh, either for statutory notices for planning applications, but also for uh, service disruptions related to roadworks. Uh, none of those processes would change. All that the policy is, is really setting out is a framework for how those things get applied. Uh, and also ensuring that we're posting all of our notices online in the future as well. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions regarding 4.6? Okay, seeing none, may I have a mover please? I see Councillor Tyler Morin, all in favor? None opposed, thank you, that carries. Moving to the next pulled item is 4.9. Surety Bonds Alternative Development Security Option, and that was pulled by Mayor Collier. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. To you, to Mr. Romanowski. Um, I'm re really glad to see this come forward. This is another uh, tool that we can use to help cut red tape and help things move forward. And I just had a couple of questions regarding the pilot. First, you've got January 1st as the start date. Is, is there any reason for January 1st or is it just you want to use the calendar year um, for this? Just this looking year? to use the calendar year as kind of the jumping off point for this project. Okay. Uh, and so if it was December 1st, it wouldn't matter. It would matter as a result of approving this report today, uh, staff will have to update the appropriate documents, wording, et cetera, in order to ensure that we're uh, ready to accept the surety bonds. So we would wanna have the, the balance of the year just to make sure we have all uh, our, uh, I guess, procedures, wording, everything in place so that come January 1, we can accept those without any, any issues going forward. Fair enough. Um, so the surety bonds basically just act as a, a type of letter of credit or in place of a letter of credit, so not to tie up capital for development. I'm wondering though, one of the things we had discussed prior and I had, I had mentioned to you um, last week was maybe making it based on a dollar value rather than necessarily a specific type of application. And, and I, you're going to look into that. Can you provide me a little yes. bit further on, on whether if we were to use this based on a dollar value? Yes, through the chair, Tim Mayor Collier, we did do a review of the dollar values. Um, through uh, finance, it was reviewed that uh, out of all the securities that we have uh, on hand, almost all of them with regards to site plan and site plan amendments are under the $1 million value. So if there was a maximum limit that council was looking to establish for security in order to have a surety bond, uh, the $1 million range would be probably the, the number that you would look at. Um, so it, it, wouldn't, it would be suitable, it wouldn't cause problems if we were instead of just to say, just for these types of applications, we were to put wording, um, and I'm thinking amendment to basically just say, um, allowing the development community to use surety bonds up to a million dollars in value. 
uh, through the chair to the mayor, uh, I think that would be appropriate, but I still would want to keep that in relation to site plan and site plan amendments uh, for the reasons that I express that we expressed within the report. Uh, just limits the municipality's risk and liability when it comes to significant pieces of infrastructure like roads and services, where we can minimize those risks through the site plan or site plan amendment applications. Okay, so by putting a dollar value, it wouldn't really make any any difference. No, sir. Okay. All right. Good. Let's keep it keep it simple. Um, are there any instances where where this wouldn't help? Like, can you give me an example of when a developer would not be allowed to use a surety bond? Well, ultimately, uh, through the chair to the mayor, ultimately it'll be up to the the proponent or the, the developer looking to secure a surety bond, they'll have to go through a, a number of tests or criteria that the provider would have to, um, that the surety provider would have to vet them through. Um, so ultimately it would be um, the surety provider determining whether or not that developer met the stress test in order to secure that bond. Uh, and then once the bond was secured or vetted through that provider, they would be able to issue the bond in accordance with our demand criteria or our wording criteria. So I don't know if there'd be any instance where we wouldn't accept it. They'd have to hit that, they'd have to overcome that first hurdle and we would accept it based on our wording and our criteria, but they'd have to meet that test with their provider. Right, so they have to show that they have the means and the expertise and everything else to be able to do the project for the surety bond provider to even give them the product. They have to qualify. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Director Valentin, did you want to add something to that? Um, thank you. Um, through the chair to Mayor Collier. <clears throat> Additionally, uh, similar to what we have in place for a letter of credit, we do have a policy in place. So we would establish a surety bond policy as well, which would stipulate the types of insurance companies that could provide those to us. So, um, and, and that's one of the things that uh, Director Romanowski was referring to. We still need time to put these policies and procedures and templates in place to ensure there's minimal risk to the municipality. Right, okay. Um, I think those are those are my questions. I'm, I'm happy to see this come forward. I'm happy to support it. I, I think it's just another tool that we can use to to help uh, streamline things, cut the red tape and um, and move things forward. So thank you very much staff for, for putting this together. Appreciate it. Happy to move it, Madam Clerk. Or uh, thank chair, you. chair, sorry. <laughs> I got it. Thank you, Mayor Collier. The next on the question list was Regional Councillor Lee and then Regional Councillor Dyes. Thank you, Chair. So <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, only currently, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, or we'll call it a handful of Ontario municipalities use this right now. And if I'm not mistaken, I did some research and I think Toronto passed it down. So what, what are reasons we wouldn't use a surety bond? <laughs> I mean, if it was so, if, it was so, it was, if it, this was such a great idea, ultimately, I'm assuming that every other Ontario municipality would be jumping on this to um, you know, cut red tape and further development. What, what, are, what are some of the uh, quote unquote cons associated with this? Um, I, I through the chair do reach on Councillor Lee. Uh, I think the cons uh, or the the negative side of it is that just kind of the misconceptions that these bonds have had uh, from their original kind of um, infancy of these this type of security product maybe over the past ten or fifteen years. But I don't know if there is much of a uh, a negative issue with them so much so now that they kind of they essentially replicate uh, letters of credit in in a lot of respects and they're rated um, under financial rating. I didn't know if Miss Mrs. Valentin wanted to add any more to that. Thank you. Through the chair to Regional Councillor Lee. Um, in the past, so these surety bonds have been around uh, for quite some time but they are um, 
uh, identified and brought forward through insurance companies. And it's my understanding in the past, it was a claim basis. So the municipality would have to put a claim forward and prove um, before we could draw down the funds. Um, in the more recent uh, investigations that uh, finance has done, as well as um, Ms. Romanowski, uh, there seems to be a bit of a, a shift um, to these surety bonds, which uh, in our investigations and some of the municipalities that have come forward with it, kind of made us a little more comfortable with bringing these forward. Um, we will ensure that we have um, our policy in place, which uh, still provides us with um, you know, the ability to restrict. We won't just accept a surety bond from any agency, like it would still have to meet a rating um, and that um, it, it will have to meet our template similar to a letter of credit. Uh, what we're proposing here is a two-year pilot to ensure that um, there's minimal risk to the municipality. So after that two years, um, we would be proposing to come back with a status update to see how the program uh, was running. And through the chair, so uh, point 2.4 on this mentions legal commentary. Our legal counsel is generally, they don't see a problem with this in terms of uh, not being paid out properly or getting to a fight. I mean, like it's ultimately one thing to, you know, get into a financial fight with the developer, but uh, an insurance company from what I'm, you know, from what I know, they're, they're pretty powerful and they're pretty high powered lawyers to fight for their money. I just want to make sure that this hasn't become an issue of creating a bigger issue down the line for ourselves. Um, through the chair, I'll, I'll take this on, Jeff. Um, when we looked at this and the template that we're providing, we're actually going to be writing in that it's a demand. Um, there's no negotiation. So we're going to be demanding payment. And if they don't like the terms of our template, then they can go uh, with another means of security. But um, this, we're trying to make sure we're minimizing the risk to the municipality. And in, in addition to uh, Director Valentin's comments, uh, that's uh, through the chair to Councillor Lee, that's how a lot of the municipalities uh, in our scan have worded their documents uh, as demands in order to um, secure those funds. And because the bonds have changed over time to more replicate the letter of credit, those de demand uh, notices are being transacted upon immediately similar to uh, letters of credit. Again, uh, similar to the questions that the mayor asked, the, before a bond's even able to be issued, that insurance provider is going through putting that that requester through a series of rigors in order to ensure that they're they're, you know, the right candidate for this type of security product. Right. Um, okay. Thank you for that. That makes you feel a bit better. Uh, last question, and thank you for uh, answering these. Um, has there been in the past, like you said, 10, 15 years, this has been around, has there been an instance where a municipality has to, has had to, you know, call in the bond and because the developer couldn't, you know, meet their financial obligations? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Lee, it's not a product we currently accept, so we we haven't had Sorry, not issue. from us, I apologize, not from us, but from other municipalities, because I'm assuming we've looked at other municipalities and their cases, right? Uh, through yeah, through the chair to regional councilor Lee, I, I'm sure that is the case because uh, just because that was the issue with the original product was it wasn't a demand. The municipalities would have had to, um, you know, build their case before the money could be released. Um, and based off of our municipal scan and the information that we've gone over in the legal commentary that we've provided, um, a lot of those, those concerns have been uh, addressed through uh, proper demand wording, having appropriate policy in place, having legal uh, review the documentations and the information that we'll be providing to these uh, uh, proponents or developers that'll be seeking this type of security. Okay, uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'll be very honest, like I'm not 100% comfortable with this. I mean, it could just be a lack of other like municipalities jumping in on it. If it's such a great idea that I figured we'd all be doing it, but this is a trial basis for two years. And so, and there's a, there's a upside cap to it. So I think, you know, our exposure is somewhat limited. So uh, thank you uh, staff for answering questions and thank you chair. Thank you. Uh, next is regional councilor Dice. Go ahead, please. 
Well, thank you. Um, Councillor Lee has uh, asked all the questions that I had. I'm too a little bit uncomfortable with the number of municipalities that are participating in this, uh, given that there's about 444 in the province and there's a handful that are doing this. I'm, and I'm a bit concerned due to, you know, Ajax's, I guess, experience with one property in particular where it's been an ongoing legal battle for many years now. So hopefully um, we'll have some more information coming forward in two years um, that will look at that because again you know it's an insurance company and they're used to paying out you know with certain circumstances I know you're saying they have they're you're going to demand it which is great I feel better about that but we'll see how that goes so hopefully in two years time we'll have some other um, you know something else to look at from other municipalities so thank you. Uh, through the chair the regional councillor dies um, although uh, it's a, a small uh, snapshot of municipalities using this particular product. Uh, they're using it in, in a far more uh, larger way than what we're proposing through this program. Uh, they're using it for all types of development agreements, etc., where we're limiting our exposure to site plan and site plan amendments. Thank you for that. But we do get, <clears throat> excuse me, we do get site plans for large um, subdivision, mind you. We're, we're quickly running out of that land mass. So we'll see. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Dyes. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Councillor Tyler Moran, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, Jeff, when was the last time we had to draw a, a letter of credit? I think the last one like is it common i think the last one was lamine right is that can you confirm that through through the chair um, um i'm not sure that we actually drew anything sorry. down um since i've been um i i used to administer the program um when i was here before and uh, very rarely would we draw down on uh, any of letters of credit um so i i wouldn't say that that's prevalent um, at this point, um, we do often do reductions. So if um, a developer has completed some of the works on their site and they ask for a reduction in their letter of credit, we can offer them that, which helps them with their security. But um, I, I can't recall the last uh, time that we've drawn down a letter of credit. Okay, so uh, again, through the chair, so it's a rare scenario. And you know, it's a good point, like for us, sometimes it works or against when none of the other municipalities have done things. Sometimes we want to catch up to them, but maybe we can be a leader in this. That's, you know, it's, it's a, maybe we're in a good position, but thank you so much uh, for answering my questions. Okay, are there any other questions regarding 4.9? Okay, thank you. I just would like to add my own comments that I appreciate the report and I am glad to see that there are some uh, tight parameters in place for this pilot period, limiting the type of um, application and the strong vetting process that the insurance company will put the requester through. I think that's very important to remember. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, so we'll move forward with just, can I please have a mover for this report? I move if I, if I may ask if the chair just briefly did um, is it council's desire and maybe maybe the mayor can speak to this to establish that upset limit, even though it may not make a difference. Uh, do we want to just have that upper limit just so we um, have kind of a threshold of consideration? I'm only putting that out there for council's consideration, given given some of the comments by by the group and I'm, I'm we're, we're, we're agreeable uh, if that's council's wish. Sorry, well, Mr. I don't think that amendment, Madam Chair, that, that, that is part of my original thought that should we have that, but it, it doesn't sound like it's going to make much difference. But the staff would be more comfortable. I don't mind making that amendment. Okay. And I saw Regional Councillor Lee's hand go up. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, just very quickly. Sorry, I forgot that we, uh, Mayor Collier actually didn't instead of introducing it. So I would personally feel a lot comfortable, a lot more comfortable with the, with the, with the upper limit, just, you know. Uh, you never know when these things are going to you know, yeah. come back and haunt us. So I very much would like to reduce our exposure on this. Okay, Director Valentin, a comment? 
Thank you. So um, we did a little scan this morning of the value, and I would say about 95% of our site plan and site plan amendment securities that we have on hand are under that million dollar threshold. So that would be an acceptable amount. Okay. So Mayor Collier, you're going to move that amendment? So Chair, very simply, the council approved the use of surety bonds as an acceptable form of security to an upset limit of $1 million for a 24 month pilot project starting January 1st, 2022. Okay. And item two remains the same. So let's just um, vote uh, on the amendment. All in favor? Are there any opposed? I don't see any opposed, it passes. So now the main motion as amended. Uh, any other questions? And if not, uh, Mayor Collier is also moving this. All in favor? None opposed, okay, it carries. Thank you. Okay, so the next item, which number was that? 4.9, so 4.10. The review of underutilized town facilities that was also pulled by Mayor Collier. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'm not sure if this is uh, through you to Natty or to Mr. Romanowski, um, but um, either or. It appears we're, we're putting together a business case of whether we want to be um, maintaining these, these properties and, and leasing them or whether we, to me, I, I I'm wondering whether we should be disposing of them. Um, so I, I had asked Mr. Ronaski last week about some of the things like land values, because if we're going to be getting a certain amount of rent, you need to know what the value is to know whether that's that amount of rent is is worth it or or not. Um, so Mr. Ronaski, I'm I'm wondering, given some of these scenarios, and I guess we can just go through them one one at a time. I'd asked you to put together the numbers on what the annual operating costs were for these facilities. Um, because where it says, for instance, um, Sundial Sales Pavilion, that's the one we've had the most recent report on, potential revenue of 57 to $71,000 a year. What would the annual operating costs be for that building? Uh, through the through the chair to the mayor, we do have a chart that we could put up on the screen okay. if 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 we're able to share our screen. Uh, I was able to take your questions and uh, um, to Nadia, and she was able to pull some information together that can help us understand that a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, what I would say though, just about the value of the properties. Uh, we don't have that specific information. Uh, if we were uh, at being asked of council to uh, determine those property values, we'd have to go through appraisal processes in order to get the, the accurate values, real-time values for those properties. Um, so if, uh, Nadia, you have the chart up on the screen, which is great. So you asked about the Sundial Sales Pavilion. Uh, operating costs on an annual basis are uh, around $7,300, as you can see in the, I guess, fourth column from the left, uh, similar operating costs for the other facilities that are identified within the report. Um, we've also outlined some general revenues based on uh, recent, um, recent use or non-use in some cases as well as identified at a high level, some capital, short-term capital improvements, as well as some more medium and long-term capital improvements to um, inform council. Um, and this information supplements the information that was already provided for within the, I believe the attachments of the report uh, that was attached. Okay, just looking at this, and I'll give you an example of, of what I'm thinking. And, and you know, as some of my colleagues are thinking along similar lines, let's go to Hartrick House. So we can't really do anything with Greenwood, but tear it down. So Hartrick House, let's say we got the same revenue as we got the last year, which is twenty eight thousand. Multiply that by twelve and divide it into to one point four million costs. That's about a two percent, and that doesn't include the seventy thousand dollar roof replacement that's going to be coming up in the 
the near future, which would take almost three years worth of revenue. So to me, looking at that, a 2% rate of return on a building that we have to manage and maintain, I don't think is a good business decision for us. Um, can you speak to that, please? Um, either Mr. Romanowski or Ms. Sikowski. Am I, am I looking at this the right way? So I guess staff's position on this is that we need to retain these buildings just to be able to respond to future changes as they come with population growth, cultural diversification. Um, and I know the real estate market is very hot right now, but that's only going to continue as years progress. Um, so it, it's our position that we should continue to retain them, but you know, come up with innovative ways to utilize these facilities to increase revenues or usage to offset those types of costs. Um, so for Hartrick House specifically, we've outlined the, the revenues for the last two years, 2018 and 2019. Uh, just a quick note there, those are only revenues for about eight months of the year. So they are a little bit below what would be typical. Um, in both those years, there were capital improvements to the facilities that took them offline. Um, so moving forward, like we'll look at 2022, post COVID anyway, and see what type of revenues those generate. Um, and then we've also identified this as potential, um, a potential facility that we can also increase usage through innovative type uses in an innovate program. Okay, and, and that's fine. That's, that's not really my question though. I'm more looking at, is it our mandate as a council and as a town to be landlords? And I don't think that is our mandate to be landlords. We have these buildings, but they do have significant costs to, to carry and have not been, from what I've seen, what I pretty much suspected before I asked for this report to be done, have not been very well utilized or over under you they've been underutilized all of them and going forward do we still want to be maintaining underutilized buildings at a cost when we have some big ticket items coming forward like the potential extension of the hunt street so we can unlock the sewer capacity and our downtown or the potential redevelopment of the village arena site into a community type building um, that's what I'm thinking about is it like, these might be nice to have, but you know, we have the Quaker meeting house, which is nice to have that we spent about $3 million on. We have the, um, St. Francis center that we spend about $4 million on, um, that, that again, aren't really being used to their full potential. I mean, we're giving free meeting space to the Masons, which is great. That was a deal. But really, we've had COVID times or not, not a lot of, of usage of that building, and it's a significant investment for the town. So that's what I'm looking at is, you know, does staff think we should keep them? Sure. Okay. But I need to see the business plan that, that warrants keeping them versus, okay. and, and I don't okay. really see that here. Well, uh, through the chair to the mayor, uh, I think in order to do a true business plan, we'd actually would have to do the appraisals in order to understand what that starting point is. Hattrick House, Hartrick House, uh, for example, uh, it says it could be sold. It's a heritage property also. So we need to factor that in the, into consideration. Not only are the buildings worth uh, worth something in dollars, but there's intrinsic value uh, associated with them as well. Space able to be used by the community, plus the properties that they're on themselves. Uh, we need to ensure that, you know, Hartrick House, for example, it's adjacent to some green space. Is there opportunities to redevelop these lands or market them or sell them? So I think through the appraisal process, if that's the direction council wants us to take, we can take this information, take that to the next level through an appraisal and build, build a business case if council's direction is to look specifically at two or three of these properties to sell, uh, if that's the direction that we're looking to go. Um, and, and you're thinking exactly along the lines of what I was thinking at, Jeff, is we need to know what the values are. And, yes, and that was the amendment that I was considering is 
do we direct staff to to get the appraisals on not all of these because some of these we can't do anything with but on some of them get those appraisals so we know exactly what we have and we can make those comparisons versus other priority things that we have as two i've mentioned the village um, redevelopment and the hunt street for our downtown so i i will make that that amendment um madam chair that and just let me go back and read the recommendation uh, there are the some other questions uh mayor collier sh shall we ask those other questions first and then and then add your amendment I guess we can. I mean, the amendment is going to be that we direct staff to do the appraisals on the Hartrick House, the Central Park Ajax Sales Pavilion, and the Sundial Sales Pavilion, and report back. Uh, I don't, and I can do that now, or I can do that after the question. It's up to you. Okay. So let's let's please wait. We'll have we'll have the other questions first, and then we'll do your amendment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Regional Councillor Lee was next. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I agree with the mayor in a lot of cases. But I also think um, um, as Ajax as a whole, you know, we talked about economic development and then we started talking about um, uh, the Innovation Village, which I think is now being considered renamed to Innovation Ajax, which I think um, the, you know, our ACD team was saying. And I think, um, you know, if you asked me before COVID, I would have said, you know, Ajax providing a text, you know, space or a play for like uh, meeting spaces and everything wouldn't have been the best economic uh, plan for us. But uh, because of COVID, because more than ever, we saw how the shift happened um, within the past 16 months to work at home, that I all of a sudden see the viability of town owned facilities uh, enabling people to have meeting spaces and workspaces and state of the art um, you know, work at home options, because I think more and more employers are hopefully seeing the light that you, you don't have to go downtown Toronto to do the job we're all doing. We've, we've done it. And I'm hoping that that shift remains and we, we, we don't have a crystal ball. That's the, that, at the end of the day. But I think, um, you know, what the mayor's asking the amendment, that's fine too, you know, let's get the values of it. But I think to, to, to uh, plan this out into January, 2024 is, should give us enough of a time to realize where where the market is going and whether we can capitalize. What I don't want to see is, you know, I, I think the 407 is a really good um, analogy here, where we sell off an asset uh, that ends up could have made us tons of money that it was unrealized at the time, and I don't want it, that to happen. So um, yeah, by all means, let's get the values of everything. But I definitely want to see this report back in 2024 of uh, what the overall plan is, because I, I I honestly believe now there is a case for work at home. You know, state of the art. You know, a municipality having the work at home, you know, work home, play home um, ability, uh, even though your job is anywhere else uh, than Ajax. So hopefully, you guys understood what I was saying. But I think that's I think that's where the market's headed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Regional Councillor Lee. Are there any other questions? Regional Councillor Dies, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, with respect to meeting spaces, I agree with Councillor Lee, you know, intensification is here in Ajax now and we can't assume that every building that will go up will have some amenity space for residents. And even if they do, oftentimes people prefer to rent a facility that has a little bit of outdoor space too. And I think that has to be considered with the population growth. But my question is about, um, I, I know this was based on the future intentions of um, businesses to grow in the future. And, you know, my concern is that we didn't include the not-for-profit sector. And I wondered why that was, because they are a business. Uh, through the chair, I can take a stab at that one. Um, so I think we've identified innovative startup businesses, but we have not yet developed the criteria in which we would be I guess, evaluating proposals for for businesses to utilize this space. Um, so we could certainly include that as a possibility, as long as I guess they're providing some type of innovative or innovative service. Um, but if it's the direction of council, we could also look at opening that up. So I guess it depends on what your definition of innovative services. We are, we are seeing through COVID that there's many innovative services that are emerging that have to do with the overall health of the community. And the two are very closely um, knitted together. If you have those services that support community, you also have economic development. 
So is it not something that we can consider? There are some that are growing and need that support. Um, is it not something that we can consider? Because they are an employer in our community and some of them are big employers. Uh, through the chair to regional councillor dies, I think just this conversation and the information that you've you've put out there, I think we can take that in consideration as we go through that that exercise. Uh, this this by no this is kind of setting that stage to see what we have, how it's being used, further direction through uh, the mayor and regional council lead to kind of look at the appraisals, get get a true understanding of the value. And, and all those things, I think, kind of this is the jumping off report for those conversations start to start to have to start to happen. Pardon me. Um, so I think if if you know we can take the words that you've already said and take that into consideration as part of our evaluation as we start to look at the Innovate Ajax program um, and uh, take take that information going forward. I would appreciate that. Thank you just add to that as well I think our intent here is to come back with a follow-up report through like an innovate Ajax focused report um, and we can provide an update on the criteria for eligibility to lease town-owned buildings and ensure that we have your comments in mind that's wonderful thank you and I saw Councillor Tyler Moran's hand go up do you have a question I do um, and I hope I'm not speaking outside the parameters of what this discussion is supposed to be but when I look at this, this um, summary of facility costs, is it for the last year, which, you know, when it says revenues, what I'm wondering is if you take Hartrick House back in 2017, was it a bustling, you know, um, community center where there was lots of banquets and weddings and meetings? Does, can anybody speak to that? Or, because I, I'd like to know, you know, what it was. It, there's obviously a reason for it there and it was, it was redone, it was uh, cleaned up and it was renovated. Now we need that $70,000 roof. But yeah, that's my question. Can anybody speak to the heyday of the Hartrick House? Was it in the last three or four or five years? Yeah, through the, uh, through the chair to Councillor Tyler Marin, uh, it's Chris Vita, Interim Director of Recreation here. Uh, so Hartrick House, since it came into the possession of the town and, and really the Recreation Department from a facility rental perspective, you are probably seeing usage similar to the numbers that you're seeing in the uh, the revenue for the last few years. Now, been a number of capital uh, projects over the years that have taken it offline at various points in time. Um, it's also been used for some limited recreation programming, not a ton, but since it came into the inventory of the department, there's been some rental interest as well as uh, some programming usage. Uh, not a ton from a programming perspective, but really from a facility rental banquet uh, usage. So uh, through you, Chair, to you, Mr. Vida, Vida, is that, are you saying it, that it, there was a lot of rentals at some point or there was some decent amount, like, like over and above the programming? The, the facility has generated you know, steady levels of rentals. Um, it's not the greatest utilized facility by any means. And really this sort of, you know, there's a long, long history of how that came into possession of the town and, and you know, became available as a rental site for us. Uh, so there's some limited history based on, you know, what we've had, you know, time, you know, within ourselves to, to rent out independently as a town as opposed to when it was under ownership by other groups so um yeah so decent usage but by no means has it been our our busiest uh busiest okay. rental facility okay. no. thank you mm -hmm. thank you councillor tyler moore next we have Mer uh regional councillor crawford please go ahead thank you madam chair um through you to probably i don't know whoever um the hartridge house you just mentioned that it is a heritage house correct Heritage That's building. correct. The tree, so, yes. With that designation, are there not some limitations as to kind of what you can do with it? Uh, through the chair to regional councilor Crawford, yes, there are limitations to what you can do with it. Uh, and that part of our consultation, further consultation would be uh, discussing that with our heritage planner, understanding the parameters by which uh, a designated property could go through transition or uh, improvements, or if if sold, how could those lands be developed? Uh, does the 
uh, heritage designation have to stay in place. Uh, so those are all the criteria that we would have to look at when, when looking at this particular property. And that could be part of the, the next version or the next steps of uh, this report. And what is that area currently zoned for? Hmm. I believe it's zoned agriculture and the OP designation is low density residential. Okay. That is correct. And so, and I, and in your appraisal, it's impossible to appraise the basement of the Quaker Meeting House, correct? I mean, it's a building of its own. You can't, you can't sell the basement, correct? Correct. That's yes. correct. So is that then, are we just appraising the whole value of the Quaker Meeting House? Uh, through the chair to regional councilor Crawford, I believe we would only appraise those properties that this council would say would kind of be, lack of a better term, be earmarked for potential sale. Okay. Um, I, based off of our report, um, we're, we haven't identified at least the Quaker meeting uh, building to be identified for, for sale at this point. And I believe the mayor identified three, three facilities uh, in his current, in his previous lines of questioning. So um, okay. if that's your direction of council, most definitely, I would just maybe caution that we should focus on those that are fully within our control in order to be able to do an appropriate appraisal. No, no, I don't want you to do an appraisal on it. Okay. <laughs> it just, I was just questioning. I, I, I missed the three. I'm sorry. I missed the three. For some reason, my lights completely went out here a few minutes ago and I was freaking out. Anyway, um, I was missing the, what were the three properties? I believe them. I, if, Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mayor, but through the chair, I believe it was the Hartrick House, the Lamine Sales Pavilion, or the Central Park Ajax Sales Pavilion, the Sundial Sales Pavilion. Okay. Um, yes, I. But I, I'll speak to the I'll speak to them when the mayor brings his his motion his amendment forward. I probably should have done that since all the questions are on the amendment. Is that all your questions, uh, Regional Councillor Crawford? Sorry, my bad. Yes, that's it. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? Councillor Kahn, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, quick question. Since we own all these properties, we have seven listed here right now. Uh, this might be directed to uh, Director Valentin, but what is, what is the arrangement with property taxes on, on, on these properties? Um, through the chair to uh, Councillor Khan, um, I'd have to look at if it's a town facility, we are exempt from tax. Um, if we're utilizing it ourselves for programming and such, then there are no property taxes on, on the, those facilities. Thank you. So that, that just means that if we were to resell them, this would be an additional income for the town of Ajax because we will be collecting property taxes on uh, from the new owners on these properties, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll dig into it a little deeper, some some more to see exactly um, what the arrangements are, because I think even like the um, the Central Park Ajax Pavilion, that's the one across from the town hall, correct? Yeah. So For the yeah. chair, yes, that's correct. That might be a bit questionable on the taxes, but that as well. So anyways, thank you very much. Just a little question that was puzzling me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Okay, Mayor Collier, please make your amendment. I forgot. If I, I, if I could, it. Chair, Mayor, <laughs> Mayor Collier, would I, could I just maybe speak to the Central Park Ajax Sales Pavilion just before you go and make your amendment? Well. Okay. Um, so we own the property already. The building is a temporary building on our property. Um, I, I would think that I, I don't know if we want to waste time necessarily doing an appraisal of that. Uh, the intent is that that building will not be there as the plaza lands in the future are developed. But if that, and I would also think that if the lands are developed, uh, any potential developer of those lands, I think this department would push that developer to use this facility uh, as their sales pavilion or sales building. Uh, as well as if the town 
didn't require the use of this building in the future, I, I think we would, in the future, when an agreement's done uh, to, or an updated agreement's done on that pavilion, that we would make it the onus of that future tenant to remove that building when they no longer need it. So I just wanted to provide that information uh, for the mayor uh, in his consideration of any amendments that he's gonna make. Thank you. Thank you, Director Romanowski. Mayor Collier, would you like to go ahead? Sure. <laughs> uh, I would like to move an amendment that staff be directed to do appraisals on the Hartrick House and the Sundial Sales Pavilion. I will take Director Romanowski's comments regarding the Central Park and not ask for it on there because we'll probably need one when that finally comes to an end anyway and we decide what we're going to do with that property. So that doesn't make sense. But the others, I would like to see the numbers on them and I'll just speak to it quickly, Chair. Um, good comments by everybody, absolutely. Meeting space, um, heritage buildings, all these things, great comments and I agree with them all. Um, but I think in order to make educated, informed decisions, we need all the facts. And I think it's important to know the values and that's all I'm asking for. I'm not suggesting that we're selling any properties today. I'm not suggesting that we're making any decisions today. Uh, I just want to, when staff come back with some suggestions as far as potential tenants for some of these, I want us to be equipped as a council to be able to make the best, most informed decisions. And, and part of that, in, ask any landlord, is you need to know the value of your building and what the ratio is at your rent to your costs and everything else. So we need that. And I think that's what we need to get done. It's not a lot of cost to get it done. And then we can make those decisions um, when it comes back. I, I just wanted to ask, um, how long do you think, Ms. Sikowski, to get those appraisals if this is approved and to report back with the next steps as outlined in the recommendation regarding um, potential tenancies and um, technology type businesses, that type of thing? So through the chair, an appraisal typically takes between three and five weeks to complete. So factoring in the time to award a contract and then take that data and kind of analyze it and bring it back as a business case, it might take until spring to come back. Okay. I don't think this is urgent. I don't think this is going anywhere right now. And I think we're not out of COVID yet. So I, I'm not really expecting this council to really make a lot of decisions on this till probably next term to be honest with you, but I, I do think we need we need that information. And I totally support things like meeting spaces and, and those types of things, but we need to justify whether we need them or not. And that's part of another report that comes out from REC. Um, and I won't ask that because I'm speaking to the amendment, but that report will also show the use of our other buildings like St. Francis, like Quaker, like the REC centers and the meeting halls that we already have in those areas and whether they are at capacity or not. You know, the Carruthers Marsh Pavilion, for instance, I don't think that's really at capacity. The Greenwood Pavilion, I'm pretty sure that's not at capacity. I know St. Francis isn't, right? So we may need meeting space at some point, but I don't think we're really close to that right now. But uh, again, that, this information is kind of vital. So I would ask for your support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Collier. Are there any questions to the amendment? I saw Regional Councillor Crawford. Go ahead, please. Um, my question is, isn't this considered an asset? Don't we have an asset meeting coming up? Isn't this under the town asset thing or is, it, or is this not considered an asset? Uh, through the chair. Uh, Diane, go, go ahead if you want. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you through the chair. Uh, yes, these would be considered uh, town facilities and assets of ours. And the value of these properties, would they not be covered under that? Uh, we have insurance uh, valuations done, but not uh, resale values, which are okay. just different. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Clerk, could you... Can we see what, what the amendment looks like on the screen, please?
Okay, moved by Mayor Collier that the motion be amended by adding the following clause. Number three, the staff be directed to conduct appraisals on the Hartrick House and Sundial Sales Pavilion properties and report back to council or the appropriate standing committee. Is that what you, is, is that correct, Mayor Collier? That's yeah, I think that'll do. Okay. And I, I think that can come back with the other report too. I don't know that we need that separately. There's, they should come together. I think that's assumed. Okay, so uh, let's vote on the amendment. All in favor? And opposed? So the motion carries. And now the main motion as amended. Um, who's moving that? Are you also moving that? Uh, we'll move it, Regional Councillor Lee. And all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries, thank you. So let's move to 4.11, which is the contract award for the pedestrian crossing at Harwood and Haskell. And that item was pulled by Councillor Khan. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I might have to ask uh, Mr. Greaves, since he's worked so diligently on this over the last few years to, to some questions. Um, I think I know most of these answers, but I just need it out there for public record. Um, Mr. Grieve, why is this before us again after direction was given earlier this year? Sure, so through the chair to uh, Councillor Khan, uh, this is before council uh, because of the award value. So this was a unbudgeted capital project um, and the award value is as seen in the report is over $100,000 and therefore in accordance with our financial policy has to come back uh, for uh, award by council. Thank you. And next question. After this is all done and approved, when does construction start? Uh, we would hope construction would start uh, within a few weeks. Um, the, the contractors uh, should be ready to go. Uh, given the slight delay uh, in getting this award, they may not fully complete the project this, this year before the, uh, the real cold weather sets in. So there may be some minor uh, site restoration that needs to be completed in the spring, but they, they will be able to get started prior uh, to the end of the year. Because weather can be a challenge to this project, correct? Correct. Um, the, there are cold weather conditions, especially with uh, the installation of concrete sidewalks, as an example, um, that can be hampered by, by cold weather. And originally, Mr. Grieve, we were thinking about uh, three to four months to have this completed, correct? Uh, yes, that's, uh, sorry, th three to four months for the entire project? Yes, from co uh, construction to the end. Absolutely, construction construction should be, um, if, if weather wasn't a factor, construction would be probably more like four to six weeks. Um, four to six sorry, weeks. if weather wasn't a, a factor, construction yeah. would be four to six weeks. Uh, it's a relatively easy construction um, um, project. Okay, so last, last part of the discussion. We went down this route for the crossing instead of a stoplight because of the widening of Harvard Avenue, correct? Uh, correct, for the, to, to have a solution uh, in place while the environmental assessment, detailed design and eventual construction um, of the widening was completed. Yes, so th this is that interim solution uh, to, to be in place while all of that other work goes on. And do we have any idea when they should commence with the widening of Harwood Avenue? Uh, in the current capital uh, long range forecast that was submitted, uh, staff are anticipating construction to begin in 2023. 2023, okay. And um, one of the things we discussed in detail was on the widening of Harwood Avenue, this most of these savings can be, or, or most of these costs can be saved with removing this crosswalk. Is that still something on the table that we can have savings with removing it or relocating it to another part of Ajax that might need a crossing? Is it being built in that way that it's, re that it's removable and salvaged to an extent? Uh, so through the Chair of Council Con, absolutely there, there are elements. Uh, this, all of the, the signage and the, the stands or the, the light poles that hold the flashing beacons, all of that can be saved. Um, 
and, and relocated to a future site. The, the, the costs that will be incurred that aren't recoverable would be, you know, the design of that and then some construction of curbs and, and concrete sidewalks that would be ultimately removed uh, when the road is widened. So yes, there, there is a large portion of the um, equipment that can be saved and reused. That makes me very happy. And it was an honor working with you on this project, Mr. Grieve. Um, makes me very happy to see this move forward and I hope we get our um, colleagues support. And Madam Chair, I'd be very happy to move this if you don't have a mover already. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grieve. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Are there any other questions regarding uh, 4.11? Okay, seeing none, moved by Councillor Khan. Uh, all in favor? None opposed, thank you, that carries. Thank you, that, that completes section four of the agenda. Section five, the discussion, we have no discussion on the agenda today. So we'll move right into 6.1, the presentation for automated speed enforcement implementation plan by the director of planning, the transportation technologist and the supervisor of transportation. Please go ahead. Excuse me, Madam Chair, if I just may interrupt. Sure. I did oppose the 4.10. Thank you, Councillor Dice. Thank you. Through the chair, I'll turn it over to Mr. Grieve and Mr. Herr to walk us through the information that we have on this matter. Yes, thank you. Let me just uh, get our screen. So, yes, thank you, uh, members of council. So, today we're here, uh, both myself and uh, Rizwan here, who is our, uh, or our ASC technologist. He is going to be uh, the town staff who is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the program. So he is your, your key point of contact should you have any questions moving forward. Um, he will be the one you know, helping with rotation of cameras, uh, analysis of, of data, uh, response to customer inquiries. So, so he is really that key point of contact. So we're here today to present you uh, the implementation plan for our automated speed enforcement program. Uh, our presentation includes a bit of background and the site selection process, uh, proposed program schedule and kind of process for the program, uh, outlines various agreements that we need to enter into, uh, provides an update on the financial implications of the program, outlines the proposed communication plan, and then uh, we summarize with uh, conclusions and the next steps. So background, I think you're all very well aware of this program. We originally presented the proposed program in September of 2020. Um, we received an endorsement and were directed to include it in the 2021 operating budget. Uh, during budget deliberations, uh, the difficult decision was made to defer it till 2022. However, in the, uh, just before the summer this year, there was a motion that was passed that changed course and had directed staff to have the program implemented in 2021. So following that direction, we embarked on our site selection process. Uh, as defined in the ASC regulation, um, automated speed enforcement can be installed in community safety zones and school safety zones and on roads with posted speed limits less than 80 kilometers an hour. In the town, we have 14 community safety zones. We do not have any school safety zones. Um, using the town's warrant, so we, we have a community safety zone warrant um, we actually, uh, areas around schools that meet the criteria, we, we establish as community safety zones. So that's just, that's the approach that the town has taken. Instead of having two different uh, descriptions of zones or two different types of zones, uh, we, we call them all community safety zones. Um, and we do feel they capture the, the necessary school areas. So for the site selection process, we needed to identify an appropriate location uh, to place the proposed cameras. Uh, we are we have identified them all and we're working with the equipment provider to ensure uh, there's sufficient space for the equipment to be placed at those spots through the process we also did a review of all regulatory signage within the corridors there's a number of uh, signage that you are required to have as part of your program and we did find a few abnormalities or elements that needed to be fixed. So you actually will see a traffic bylaw update that we will present at November Council. That really is just updating a few elements of both the speed limit schedule 
and uh, community safety zone schedule. Uh, and then finally, we have placed the required uh, municipal speed enforcement coming soon signs at our first three locations uh, for the uh, proposed cameras. So I think you all know this list very well. These are our community safety zones in town. There are four in Ward 1, uh, six in Ward 2, and four in Ward 3. So just as an example, here's a, an example of the required signage for any uh, zone. Uh, you can see down in the bottom left of the screen, you need your community safety zone or CSZ begins and ends signage. So both at the left side of the screen, the beginning of the corridor, and then the right side of your screen, the end of the corridor. Uh, there is required uh, speed limit signs. So you, you, you are required to have uh, the speed limit posted. So in the case of the town, if we have um, zones that are actually on a 50 kilometer hour road, despite what our traffic bylaw says that 50s are not required to be posted, uh, we would have to post in this case uh, as it's required within the ASC regulation. Then there is uh, ASC regulatory signage uh, that you see there around the camera locations. Uh, that starts as the municipal speed enforce, enforcement coming soon signage, uh, and then is transferred to uh, the municipal speed enforcement in operation signage uh, to, to um, notify drivers of uh, that they are in a, an area. And then the final element that we have placed in all of our community safety zones is that uh, the digital radar speed board. So that's that flashing board you see that notifies drivers of their speed. Not only is it an educational tool for drivers, uh, it, al it also serves as a da uh, data collection point for us. We are able to some uh, collect that data and, and use it in our analysis. So very quickly, as I said, the radar message boards, you'll see those in the, uh, in the zones, those have been placed. Um, a few more to still be placed as we wait for locates for polls, uh, but those will be up. Uh, the bottom uh, middle picture is, a, is an example of the ASE mobile unit. Looks very much like a traffic uh, signal control board. Uh, those are placed in the boulevard. And then there's the two examples of the, uh, the top coming soon signage, which I said, as I said, is placed at our first three locations already. And then once that camera is deployed, you switch to a uh, in use sign. And that's the example in the bottom right of your screen. So uh, we had to come up with a proposed schedule for the program. And uh, our goal was to see a camera deployed at every location within the first year of the program. So we have 14 community safety zones. We've actually identified 15 camera locations. And that's uh, simply because the Delaney Drive community safety zone ended up having two camera locations placed in it, uh, just because of its size. It was a quite a long stretch of road. And we felt it needed uh, two camera locations. So we have 15 locations to uh, work through um, in our program as of now. Um, we are proposing that we deploy a camera at a, at a location for approximately eight weeks before it is rotated. And really the proposed schedule that we'll present today uh, is preliminary and is subject to change. Uh, we, you know, we may see or decide uh, to rotate uh, more quickly than eight weeks. We may leave cameras in place longer than eight weeks. Um, that is uh, really, uh, kind of up to our operational decisions. And uh, as I said, that, that, rate, that radar feedback sign will be a tool that will let us watch uh, in real time kind of what is happening and, and help us make those decisions. So you'll see this schedule or the two pages of this schedule in, in the report that we presented, but here's the example of uh, just that first page. So that those first three lines, those are our first three locations in blue, uh, Delaney Drive, McGill and Williamson. As you can see, we got the coming soon signage posted toward the end of September. And as per the regulation, those must be in place at least 90 days before you activate your uh, speed cameras or your, municipal or your enforcement cameras. So those are up for the request requisite 90 days. We then allow in our schedule for a week of deployment. So that is placing the camera and completing the validation uh, that is required with the Joint Processing Center. And then you see operation for 
uh, eight weeks. Um, you can then see the kind of cascading effect of the schedule and that we will have to post our next coming soon signs in the middle of December at our next three locations. And, and that time runs out and then so on and so forth through the, the, the rest of the rotations. Um, as I said, town or staff haven't considered uh, at this point what uh, years two, three, four of this program look like at this point. As I said, our, our first goal of this schedule was every location within the first year of operation, which is what we've achieved. Moving forward, we may simply continue on this rotation. Um, there could be locations that are added, so you would have more lo locations to make or get to, uh, or we may see a targeted approach. We may look after our first year and see that there are a handful of, of locations that we want to target, and so that, that year two schedule may look a lot differently. That's something uh, uh, that can be determined at a later date, and definitely we can present uh, to council when those decisions are made. So with regards to the process, what happens when those cameras are in place? Uh, an image of the real life, so a vehicle that is captured uh, it, with an offense, an image of their rear license plate is taken. That image is saved locally on the device and then securely transferred by the equipment provider to the Joint Processing Center for verification. At the Joint Processing Center, provincial offense officers review the images and validate the, vi the violation. They then mail the violation uh, to the registered owner of the vehicle. Physical and electric, electronic copies are then sent to Ajax for reconciliation and for us to file with Durham Region Courts. Uh, and then we've had an, we've made an agreement with uh, Durham Region Prosecution uh, that they will handle any fines or any violations which are contested from the Ajax cameras. Uh, so our agreements, I think all of you know very well that there are the three standard ones to operate an AIC program. So Redflex is the equipment provider. Uh, we, there's an agreement that's required with MTO to access the vehicle registration database. And then the agreement with the City of Toronto to operate the Joint Processing Center. Uh, I just mentioned it. There is now a fourth agreement that we are signing with Durham Region. To have them handle all of the town's uh, ASC prosecution services. Uh, we came to this decision after some discussion internally with staff and discussion with Durham Region. Uh, it's interesting to note, uh, so region prosecutions obviously handle all of their um, tickets, violations, and they also have signed a similar agreement with the city of Pickering to handle their prosecutions. So from a uh, Durham region wide um, perspective, all prosecutions will go through Dur uh, the Durham region prosecutors, which is a uh, a, a good thing and that uh, there won't be any confusion as to who is uh, handling those those uh, um, tickets as they are contested. And so those all four of those agreements are in their final review and in, yeah, I expect they will be executed very shortly. So financially, um, this, I believe these numbers have been updated slightly since you last saw them and they reflect the uh, the annual or the Daily camera rate uh, with HST applied to it, um, or our, sorry, our HST share, I should say, um, for our three cameras. Um, we're estimating a, a first year program of, of five, or we're estimating 5,000 tickets in our first year of programming. Uh, this is the, the capacity limit that we have been given at this time. Uh, it is subject to change, and, and obviously, should we be able to increase that capacity, uh, we, would, we would do so. But just for this calculations purposes, we've, we've associated that with 5,000. And so you see your access, MTO access fee, your joint processing fee, um, uh, an estimate for the uh, prosecution services by Durham Region, some miscellaneous costs, which are uh, mainly associated with the rotation of the camera, and then our staff costs for that technician who manages the program. So you can see just uh, just under just uh, 275, just under 300,000 in total costs. Obviously, there will be some revenue generated from this program. What we really don't know is is how much at this time. Obviously, all revenue generated are based on uh, the speed the fine is is or the speed the ticket is issued at, and then um, other associated costs within the Durham Region Court system. Uh, we're just not aware of yet, so. Um, I think it's fair to assume some revenue will come back to the town, 
but to how much and, and to what extent we don't know at this point. And finally, there is a one time uh, fee associated with the, the setup of the joint processing center. So this was a total cost to set that facility up and every municipality that has joined pays this, pays their proportionate share. And then as more municipalities join, uh, uh, your, your fee is rebated down to whatever that new proportionate share is. So I believe we are the 13th that has joined. So our, our fee is 66,000. As more join, the proportionate number is lower. Uh, we will see a rebate come back to us. So uh, with the communication plan, uh, working with communications, we have set up an ASC specific web page, which includes program details. It will eventually have the uh, unit certificates and all the associated bylaw schedules. We'll have a frequently asked questions section and then our contact information. A public meeting has been scheduled for November 30th, where we invite the public to go over this plan and give them more information on what the uh, program will be. Uh, we are working on a social media campaign, not only for prior or pre uh, operation, but, but in the days of the, the first few days of operation. And then we ensure that we will update council regularly uh, once the program is operational and we will update our, our public regularly uh, through the website as well. So finally, our conclusions and next steps. Obviously, we need to finalize and execute those agreements, update the necessary traffic bylaws, finalize the preparations of those sites for deployment. Uh, we will host the public meeting and then confirm our go live date. And when I say confirm it is that we need to make the final decision on what that day will be. Uh, based on the 90 day um, regulatory posting requirement that I noted previously for the coming soon signs, uh, we could go live as early as December 24th, 2021. However, there is staff recommendation that we do uh, choose a date in early 2022 as our go live date, given the, uh, the holiday season. So those are just our two recommendations that are contained within the report, as I noted, updating the schedules, the bylaw schedules at November Council, and then our recommended go live date is January 10th. So thank you for that. Uh, Rizwan, myself, and uh, Director Romanowski are here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Grieve. I do have a question list. Uh, the first person is Mayor Collier. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to Mr. Grieve. I'm... So you just finished up by saying the earliest day we could go live was December 24th, which means the 90 day signs must have gone up on September 24th. Yet this council gave recommendation or direction back and I think it was June. I, I guess I'm wondering why the agreements aren't signed and why the signs weren't up till September 24th when this direction was given in June, which is kind of further delaying the process. The direction given by council was also that this be implemented in 2021, but the recommendation is January, 2022. Good share to Mayor Collier. Uh, you, you are correct. It was September 24th or 23rd that the, the three signs were posted. Um, there was a significant amount of work to get to that point. Um, uh, so yes, you're right. The council gave direction at the end of June. Uh, to proceed with uh, implementing this program in 2021. Uh, it, it wasn't on the transportation schedule work, scheduled work plan, so we did have some uh, rearranging to do. We, rec we retained or, or hired uh, Rizwan in the first week of July. Uh, we then needed to proceed with uh, data collection in all of our community safety zones to understand traffic, uh, then identify those locations where the cameras would be, obviously taking into considerations um, Kind of sight lines and other elements that need to be considered. Once those locations were identified, we needed to confirm uh, that they were appropriate or at least appropriate at, at a high level. Uh, once that was done, um, we worked with operations to work into their schedule times to, to uh, install those signs. We had to have them, sorry, first uh, made. Um, and then we had to work again with bylaw or sorry, operations to install. 
They also installed our radar feedback signs. So those that took some time. So it, it, it really was, it was just a, a timely process with many steps in it. Uh, we would have loved to do have done, done it sooner, but that was the date that we were able to get to. And then um, we continue to push that the, the agreements are not what is holding our um, go live date back. It is, it is that 90 day period. That is the, the driving factor of the recommended um, date. Okay, so let's get those signed then. Because the last thing I want is a, is another delay that, oh, now we have to get, can we get those done right away? Is Absolutely. They, uh, those? Through the they chair, should through be, the mayor, we're already working on that. Yeah, they should be with uh, yourself and the clerk by week's end. As soon as they hit my desk, they'll be signed. So that's fine. These speed boards have been up for a few months now. Do we get to see that data? I assume the three positions that we're going to be having automatic speed enforcement are the three um, that those speed boards have shown have the highest amount of speeding. So yes, the, the, the sorry, the, the decision on the schedule was based on the uh, physical data collection that we did in July. And you're correct. The, the, the schedule is generally based on uh, roads with the worst compliance first. Uh, we also did some balancing ward wise. We didn't want to do all of one wards, you know, right away. And then the other wards are waiting. So it, it's, it's a bit of a balance. Um, but you're, you're, you're correct in your assumption that the worst violators are first. Um, as for the board or the data on those speed boards, absolutely, we can, we can pull that and, and share that with council if that's something they're interested in seeing. I, I would be interested in seeing that, Jonathan. Thank you. I, and I know the local councillors might not be happy about this, but I don't think this should be really based on a ward system necessarily. It should be on where the highest need is. That's my personal opinion. But I, I really think this should be not just necessarily ward based. If we've got, and I'm just picking on, on one, I'm not, if X ward has all the speeding and there's nothing down in Y ward, I don't want to put one in Y ward just for the sake of having one in Y ward. Is there anything restricting us? Can we, you put them, is there a policy that says they go where we have the highest number of offenses and the most need, like what we do for traffic calming? Uh, there's not, but, but as I suggested with my, my, my year two through four schedule, I think that is absolutely what uh, the town should do is once we have gone to all locations once, we really should switch from a more, you know, democratic, you know, everyone gets a little bit to uh, targeting those areas of concern. I think that is a, a very appropriate approach for years two and beyond. But for the first year, we, we need to try all of them and, and see the impacts of those cameras. Okay, that's fine. Now, I know now that there's a 5,000 ticket limit is that per camera or is that for us as a whole that is for us for as a whole okay are all other municipalities under that same limitation because we only have three and for us to have a five thousand ticket limit for three and then you've got a municipality like toronto that has 50 i how are they restricted so everyone does have a restriction um, it is partly based on when they joined the program, and then it is partly based on uh, the anticipated volumes uh, from their cameras. So at the time of, of us having the discussions with the processing center, they were nearing capacity based on the COVID restrictions that they were under, and that's why they gave us the 5,000 limit. That is as much as they could process should those restrictions still be in place over 2022. I fully anticipate those restrictions are, are easing and I would see our limit being increased throughout the year. And it was just simply in the, in the planning of the program, that was the target we started with. And, cool. and we, can, we can adjust on a weekly basis um, our program uh, forecasts. So if we'd started this a year ago, we might not have a limitation. We would still have a limitation, but it would be higher, very likely. You, you, that's fair to assume. But there's probably other municipalities like Toronto, for instance, that might not have any limitation. Is that what you're saying? 
No, the city, the city of Toronto has a self-imposed limitation in that they know um, if they if they ran those 50 caverns wide open all the time, they would take up the full capacity of the processing center. So they 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 absolutely have a limitation as well. Okay. Um, so everyone has one, and it's just a matter of of managing within that. Okay, I just want to make sure it's fair. I mean, we're paying per camera per day, not per ticket. If we were paying per ticket on our rental costs, that'd be great, but we're not. So we're, we're stuck with fixed costs, but potential limited revenue. Is there any uh, flexibility on us being able to set the threshold in which a ticket is issued? If we're only allowed 5,000 tickets, I think we should make those count. I don't want to be ticketing people that are over just a little bit and using those up and letting, and then maybe we run out of capacity and then the ones who are really exceeding the speed limit get a buy. Do we have any so, flexibility with that? Uh, no, there is a threshold. It is, it is a standardized threshold across all um, municipalities running the program. And so that everyone is working on that threshold. And so um, it, it is not something that it, an individual municipality can adjust or can, um, change okay but we can control what hours of the day the cameras are operational correct? that is correct and, and we fully intend to we will have um you know under this restriction we won't be our cameras won't be on 24 hours a day initially but they will be operating at all hours of the day and that schedule will change um throughout their deployment so that um uh, it is most effective okay so we can look at our speed boards we can identify the times of day where speeding is the worst and we can set the cameras up to run during those times to have the most effect. That's exactly what we intend to do. Let's talk about revenue for a minute because I find it really difficult to comprehend that municipalities like Pickering is now up and running. Toronto has added, I don't know how many more cameras. The region has added a bunch more cameras. These, these have been operating for well over a year that there isn't any data available that speaks to the revenue generated. Because we talk about the cost and that's fine. I, I'm absolutely fine with the cost because I think we will slow people down and create a more safe environment. And if it costs us $278,000, it costs us $278,000. But why can we not get any information on what sort of revenue that we're going to generate so at least we know if we're on a break even or not um, so there, there's a few reasons behind that i mean first and foremost the revenue is based on the speed the ticket is issued at and that is different on every road in every municipality so it's it's hard to estimate exactly what we're going to see we can we can do a projection based on what we maybe see on that road today but as soon as you put it out of camera that that pattern is going to change. So that's, that's the first difficulty is you can't know exactly what every ticket's going to come in at. Um, no, but and, but secondly, an average or something? We could, but, it, but again, it, it would be difficult. And then, so then the second element was, uh, especially under the prosecution system we have in the region where we re rely on Durham region courts, uh, even they weren't processing tickets up until a few months ago. They have told us that uh, a greater than 50% percentage are simply paying the ticket. So, so that is, I guess, encouraging from a prosecution's perspective that our prosecution costs are, are very likely to be no more than what I presented today. A and under that scenario, yes, you know, there should be some revenue that absolutely brings the municipality back closer to break even. Um, but we just don't know that yet. And then Director Valentin has also been speaking extensively with Durham Regions Finance about how do we ensure that all of the costs specifically related, costs in the revenues specifically related, related to Ajax cameras or Ajax run cameras in Ajax are properly tracked so that at the end of the day, we do get a true number and they don't get blended in with Durham Regions camera in Ajax or, or others. So there's, there's some back-end financial work that needs to be done as well. Director Valentin, would you like to add to that? 
Thanks. Um, as Mr. Grief had mentioned, I have been in uh, communication with the region on several occasions just to try and get um, an estimate of if we will receive any revenue. Um, as Council is aware, we have some ASE, um, their regional run cameras and red light cameras in the municipality right now. Unfortunately, um, the town has not received any income uh, revenue from any of these cameras. So that was my first question. And then as Mr. Gree had pointed out, um, I'd like to understand, you know, if we will be able to see uh, revenue from our own uh, cameras that we will be paying for. Um, in the discussions that I've had with uh, finance staff at the region, uh, the court systems are not quite at capacity and due to COVID restrictions, they, they're um, very much restricted. I think they have one court open right now. They are looking to lift um, <clears throat> to lift the capacity limits and, and try to open those up. Um, I have not been given any defi definitive information on any revenue numbers. Um, I continue to you know, reach out to see if any I can get in, any information, but at this point I've received nothing. And in the absence of not having any information, we're just going to assume at this point that it's a cost. Well, that's that's interesting because I, I wouldn't, I don't think any of us, and correct me if I'm wrong, expected the region just to keep all proceeds from the cameras operating on town roads. I mean, I, I don't expect us to get a, a percentage of tickets the police issue on roads, but I certainly, and I think it's everybody's expectation that Ajax will receive the funds after we pay all the costs. We're paying the court processing fees. We're paying all those costs. Surely we can find out from other municipalities that have cameras, whether they're getting proceeds or not. This is why I don't understand this black hole, which is revenue that we can't seem to get any data on. Like what a name, what's another municipality? Not Toronto, they, they have different everything, but like Pickering. And we find out if Pickering is receiving revenue. I mean, surely- I, I can definitely reach out and that would give an indication for us because I believe they're going through the region as well. Pickering oh, would I be a good example. They, 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 courts. Correct, they, but they're, I mean, their program is in the infancy, but, you, but they would be our best example because they are the, they are under the same prosecution agreements and process. So uh, staff, we can reach back out uh, to read or sorry, to Pickering to see if they've they've had any um, per updated projections. Okay. And just final question, has there been any movement as far as our direction given to the region, our request that it be a regional operated plan or system? So to my knowledge, uh, a, a, a staff report responding to that uh, is in the works. Um, and should be presented to, uh, I believe it's to works committee in the coming months. And uh, we'll wait for that to officially be presented to see what their response is and uh, what next steps would be. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor Collier. The next speaker is Regional Councillor Crawford and then Dyes and then Tyler Moore. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, uh, John Grease for all the work that is put into this. I know just from being on Vision Zero how much work is involved in um, in, in putting it up, and with you know seriously very limited staff. And Rizwan, thank you for uh, for your help also. Um, and being off kind of the project list, I do appreciate the fact that uh, well, you know, nothing ever moves fast enough for council. Uh, that you were working at the speed that you could during the time. So I do appreciate that. And I think this might even be your last official meeting. Is that correct? I'm very sorry. That, yeah, no, that is correct. This will be my last official meeting with the town. So I do want to thank you for all the work that you put in off topic completely. Sorry, Madam Chair, uh, for trying to keep our roads safe and, uh, and just trying to keep council happy is just definitely been a full-time job, <laughs> probably very underpaid. Anyway, Back to the agenda. So community safety zones, if a police officer stops you speeding in a community safety zone, it's a double ticket, correct? That is correct. Can you tell me how that process is through, uh, through the system? through the? Because I don't believe the camera doubles the ticket, correct? No, that is incorrect. The camera will also double the ticket. It does? Okay. That Good. is correct. Good to know, okay. 
Um, and again, given the fact that we know from just the data that's happened uh, through the region, uh, it is a reduction of at least 30% in speed, 37% in speeding on streets. That's the best, that's the, the best results we've ever had in any form of road calming uh, that has been tried to put on. Do you not agree that this program should be expanded outside of the community safety zone, school zone? Uh, I, I, I think it could be considered. Um, personally, I don't think automated and speed enforcement works for every road. Um, I, I do think traditional traffic calming can work on, on other areas. Um, I think this program is very well suited in that it is in those community safety zones and school safety zones where the most vulnerable populations tend to be. And so that's the best place for a program like this. Um, I think if you if you let it happen everywhere, you, you you probably would minimize its impact, and and um, you could even saturate the the kind of the network. And, and I and I don't think you would achieve the same results. So uh, I think it's it's appropriately scaled. I think the town can look at adding more community safety zones. I definitely think there's there's more of those in town, and therefore you have more potential locations for cameras. I would encourage that. But as for having cameras on every single road, I would caution against that. So, um, no, I do, I do realize that. But do you, to, to identify the community safety zone, does it have to be a, a school on that road? Uh, no, it doesn't. So the town, we have a community safety zone warrant where we, we established a process um, across, there are, I believe it was nine criteria in a, in a scoring matrix, and it was staff's recommendation that you achieve a certain score in order to be designated a community safety zone. And so uh, any request would go through that process. If it met the scoring, we would then establish it as a community safety zone, and uh, therefore then would be eligible to be part of the ASC program. So that in itself expands the program incredibly, right? If it's not necessarily understand that you want to be able to protect your most vulnerable population. But uh, if, if a street does meet those warrants, then it doesn't necessarily have to have a school on it to have the camera put on it, correct? That's correct. I think if I'm remembering correctly, when we established the warrant, we looked at, I believe it was 40 segments in the town. And I think at the time we, we said uh, almost 20 of them met our criteria and at the time we proposed bringing forward 12 new ones which gets you to the 14 we have so there are there are 10 or so that met the scoring but we haven't designated as community safety zones at this point okay okay good um so the the radar speed boards that are up currently do they stay in place uh while the cameras are up or are they moved to a different street uh, to to monitor the speeds. Those are there. Those are there permanently, and they're there permanently uh, in order to capture, uh, you know, uh, speed characteristics. Speed characteristics prior to the camera being there, while the camera is there, and then after the camera leaves. That that will really help us understand what is happening. You know, is the change permanent? And that really will then feed into, as I discussed, the, the second year schedule of where do you go back to and why and, and so on and so forth. So they, they are there permanently. Yeah, I know the region put the armadillos uh, in the, in, especially in the initial uh, group of um, uh, cameras, they put those little speed cameras up to do exactly the same thing, to monitor the, the speeds. Anyway, um, so eight weeks social, oh yeah. I, the social media piece in the first year, are we going to be using social media every time we move a camera, like in that first year until people get used to it? I think people are used to it now. They see enough of them out there. Um, but is it just in the initial stages that we're going to do uh, the social media or every time we do a rotation? Or is that uh, determined? I think it's a little bit still to be determined, but okay. but if it, if it was my opinion, I think it's more of just the the early days of the program because you could because you are exactly correct that this is a this is a type of program that that is being seen by a lot of people in a lot of places. I don't think we need to 
every time something changes, notify. Um, you know, there may be periodic updates, but I, I really think the communication plan will focus around uh, not only the coming weeks when we're going to have our public meeting, but then, you know, the weeks around when we turn everything on. I think that's the focus of the program or the focus of the plan. I know for a fact that the red light camera at Delaney and Westney is the highest ticketed a red light camera in all of Durham region. I think you know that too. Uh, Bailey was one of the highest uh, speeding cameras, but I think that that's dropped significantly since they've had now, they're on their, they're getting a permanent camera on that location, period. So it's going on, it will never be moved around. But anyway, uh, thank you again for all your hard work. Really appreciate it. And uh, your patience with my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Next, we have Regional Councillor Dyes. Go ahead. I'm good, thank you. My questions have been answered, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tyler Morin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My questions have all been answered, except for one. Uh, I'll just start off by saying, um, good luck, John. Uh, uh, Mr. Grieve, I know we've worked together a lot uh, since we became council. I hope for the most part it was okay. But I know you did a lot of work. So uh, all the best to you and your family and your new endeavors. Um, I'm just asking it through the lens of a, of a resident, they always say to me, does this include points? Could you speak to that? You get a ticket, is it just monetary? Or are there points as well? Does the insurance company know? Do you know can you speak to that? Thank yeah, it, it is just a monetary fine. Given that um, there's no way to verify the driver of the vehicle, it is right. simply the, the registered owner is the one that receives the ticket and it is a monetary only. There are no demerit points associated with it. Okay, excellent. And your breakdown of exactly how many fees we have is very helpful uh, to squelch the great cash grab, you know, uh, statements that uh, residents sometimes make. But thank you so much and all the best. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we have Councillor Khan. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, uh, between uh, Councillor Crawford and, and the Mayor, uh, most of my questions have been answered. Um, John, on page 549, you have the total annual cost of $278,300, right? And then just beneath that, you have a one-time joint processing center cost not included. So that's $66,700. So that total to start up is going to be $345,000, correct? That's correct. So I was doing that's the math, what it's going to do to break even at 70 bucks a ticket for the 5,000 tickets. And then I realized through Maryland, uh, Mayor, Regional Council of Crawford that, uh, Tickets might be double depending. I, I would not know what a speeding ticket looks like. So I did not know that your, your ticket prices depend on how fast you were going because obviously I don't speed. But um, I was doing the math and I thought it was like 70 bucks a pop to make us a break even. Then the mayor said from the mayor's question that we might not be getting uh, uh, any kind of uh, payment back from the region. So anyways, that's me rambling, but I was doing all my math in vain. Thought we had to pop 70 bucks a ticket to make back our money, but we don't even know we're going to get that. So anyways, thanks. My question was if the 278 plus 667 was our startup cost, which is $345,000. And hopefully, hopefully we can get some of that money back. And like uh, Councillor Tyler Warren said, it's, it's, it's not a, crash, a, a cash grab for us. Thank you, Mr. Grieve, again, for all that you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, so just, just a quick one for, for me. Thank you very much for the presentation and the report. So there is an open house scheduled on November 30th? That is correct. Okay, and that will be, I, I guess it will be covering all of this information. Uh, and yes, it, it will be a very similar presentation to what, to what you saw this, this afternoon. Um, we may include a bit more information, maybe some, some information more on our, our website, but it, it will be very similar to give uh, those in attendance an understanding of kind of what the program is, uh, what its intents are, and um, and to answer questions. I, I, I anticipate, you know, the presentation may be 15 minutes long, but I suspect the question period will be uh, uh, hours would be my, my, my guess. Uh, so far, there are 57 registrants last time I looked. Oh. So it will, it will be very well attended will be my um, my guess. All right. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, there were two recommendations given. 
that staff bring forward the amendments to the speed limit schedules of the town's traffic bylaw to the November council meeting and that the automated speed enforcement cameras for the town of Ajax ASC program be activated on January 10th, beginning with the first three locations and rotated as per the schedule outlined in the proposed deployment schedule in this report. May I please have a mover for that? I see Regional Councillor Crawford, uh, all in favor? Okay, and that carries, thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the next presentation, which is the Municipal Election Candidate Event Support Program. And I'll ask for Director Cooper and uh, Ms. Moore, please. Thank, thank you very, very much, Madam Chair. Chair. So Sarah has a brief slide deck for you that will just give you a, basically a 20,000 foot overview of the program that we're proposing. But if it's all right, I just wanted to say a few words first uh, that go sort of to the impetus for what's before you today. So you would all be aware that the town has historically played a very large role in delivering candidate debates leading up to a municipal election, uh, either behind the scenes, but more recently, a little bit more up front. And the increasing degree of town involvement has, has basically become necessary in recent elections because not for lack of any, uh, any lack of effort, uh, staff in our communications division have just had a really difficult time finding a truly objective, capable, and willing partner to deliver uh, that debate program. And I just want to say that the town's role in making sure debates happen over the last three to four years is something that I think we can be really proud of. Um, it creates more informed voters, it engages the community, it's, it strengthens our local democracy, I think. But um, admittedly, it's always been a bit of an uncomfortable dance for town staff trying to accomplish those things while also maintaining an appropriate distance from, from the more political and campaign related aspects of the election, especially for those of us that are directly involved in running the election. And, and as you all know, the landscape has just changed so much over the last decade. Elections are more competitive. Uh, they've been completely transformed by social media. Public scrutiny is heightened. And in my view, it, it's just more important now than ever that the town as the entity that delivers the election is completely objective, independent, and really deliberately distanced from candidates and their campaign activities, both in practice, but also in perception. And so in the current environment, uh, it's staff's view that it's just no longer tenable for the town to be as closely involved in the delivery of those events as we may have been in the past. But the alternative of, of basically doing nothing and running the risk that these events don't happen at all wasn't really palatable to us either. I mean, it, we believe in the value of candidate debates and, and we care deeply about the health of our democracy. And, and so we want to keep investing in that. So, you know, being faced with this choice of debates run by the town or no debates at all, uh, we've tried to sort of come down the middle here and propose a solution that will sidestep the problems of the town being too involved in these things while still engaging the community and still serving our democracy. So no doubt there's some risk factors involved here uh, in what we're proposing. I'm sure you'll, you'll all have some questions, but I, I do hope that overall you'll find that this is a, a novel and creative solution uh, that we've come up with you uh, for you today. So with that, I will just pass it over to Sarah. Thank you, Director Cooper. So I'm pleased to introduce the Municipal Election Candidate Event Program to committee this afternoon. We know that an informed elector is a prepared elector. We know that electors receive election and candidate information in a multitude of ways, such as social media, campaign ads, signage from the local municipality itself and through candidate websites. These are all great communication tools, but in-person candidate events such as debates and forums are traditionally the most engaging and they're the best informative ways for electors to learn about their candidates. And such information is a crucial factor in helping electors decide how to cast their ballot, which is why staff are recommending the implementation of the Municipal Election Candidate Event Program. As Director Cooper mentioned, for the past several elections, the town has been one of the few municipalities to take on the role of coordinating candidate debates and seeking out community partners to organize the events to host. However, in 2018, the town was unable to find interested partners to host the debates, which resulted in the town opting to organize and host such events itself at a considerable expense of staff time and resources. 
The municipal election candidate event program will provide town resources to independent residents or community organizations who want to take on the role of hosting a candidate event for their own community. The municipal election event program is an exciting and innovative opportunity for the town in order to empower public engagement in the democratic process. It will build capacity for community led leadership opportunities and we are proud of the town's long standing history of leadership in election administration. For example, as Director Cooper mentioned, during the past several elections, we've been one of the only municipalities to host candidate debates. And just recently, and quite notably, Ajax ranked fifth in the Ontario 2021 Democratic Index Report. Candidate events, whether they be formal events like debates or less formal events like meet and greets, are most effective when they are delivered by the community for the community. While the town has facilitated, pardon me, facilitated these events in the past, the town's legislative role to administer the election in a free and fair manner should be of utmost importance and should be focused on the integrity and accessibility of election delivery. The challenge is to find ways to encourage and facilitate community engagement and participation in the electoral process while remaining at arm's length from the process itself. The proposed program overview will provide up to $1,000 for eligible expenses for each event hosted. Additional in-kind supports will also be made available, which could include things such as facility rental fee waivers, printing of promotional materials, contact liaising for audiovisual support or accessible communications, as well as Durham Regional Health Department services, and circulation of any volunteer opportunities associated with the candidate events through the town's volunteer portal. The program will seek to fund one to two events for each of the five candidate categories. Wards one, two, and three local and ward councillor candidates, mayoral candidates, and regional chair candidates. The format of the event does not need to be a formal debate, but could also be an informal meet and greet, luncheon, or community town hall question forum. The type of event hosted for each category will depend on the applications received. In the event that no application is received to run an event for a particular candidate category, town staff will work with the other approved applicants to fill gaps wherever possible. Where multiple promising proposals are received for the same candidate category, staff may work with the various groups to encourage jointly delivered events and where appropriate and beneficial, if no applicants are interested or available to fill those gaps, town staff may encourage them to take on one of the categories. Town staff will not be responsible for hosting an event if a particular candidate category does not receive any interest in delivering an event. All candidate events must be inclusive of all candidates in the category. They must be hosted in a town of Ajax venue at an accessible location that is free to attend and most importantly are conducted impartially. Within the process of the program itself, there are several key areas embedded for accountability. The application and selection of participants will be reviewed and selected prior to the opening of the nomination period for candidates. As well, applicants will sign off on impartiality and if selected, will be required to sign a formal letter of agreement. After the event, a summary report will be required prior to any final payment disbursements. And it's worth noting that corporate communications will be responsible for the full program administration. If the program is approved, the proposed implementation timeline will see that the launch and promotion of the program begin in early 2022. The application review and selection period will take place in February or March, well in advance of the opening of nominations. Events will be held during a period after the certification of nominations, targeted between August 22nd and October 14th, with final event reporting due by December 31st of next year, before any funds are dispersed. And as this is a new program, a complete review of the program will be reported to Council as part of the comprehensive post-election reporting to the committee. At this time, I'm happy to turn it back to Madam Chair and committee for any questions. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Moore. Uh, first on the question list is Mayor Collier. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Through you to Ms. Moore or, or uh, Ms. Cooper. Just on that last slide, um, that was one of my questions I was going to get to, but uh, it says the so it sounds like the people who want to do this will upfront the cost and then disbursement of funds will be after everybody has posted their financials. Is that correct? Through the chair, the intent is that there will potentially be upfront costs associated with the program, but with the in-kind support of fee rental waivers, printing of materials, we're hoping to offset some of the larger expenses to facilitate such events. And there are provisions within the policy that do allow under um, various circumstances, should there be a particular invoice that might need prepayment or authorization, that staff can work with those applicants to determine whether or not any advancement of fees can be available. Okay, so at, at the end of the report, it says the estimated cost is between five and $10,000 of this, of this program, and that it's up to a maximum of 10 events. So wh what did we spend in 2018? How much did to the running of all the events cost the town in 2018? Through the chair, I would have to defer to my colleagues in communications. I unfortunately don't have that information available. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I was just wondering if it was more or less than the five to 10,000 that this policy or program is estimating. No idea? That's fine. Maybe just if you can let me know that um, between now and council, please. Through the chair, we can certainly provide you with that information. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to make sure, and again, if you're talking about, so I guess just so I understand, a person or group would apply to the town and would get approval and then would go ahead and do all this. And we may cover the room rental at the ACC or something. We may be able to give them some in-kind and they would get the balance after when the disbursements are done. But is that, that correct so far? That's correct so far. Okay. Interesting. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, because that, that could be upwards of five, six months, depending. I mean, uh, who knows? I, or hold on a second. Okay, the events being August and October. So it could be four or five months. I, I don't know. I, I'm just wondering how, how do we stop people who, or how do we vet, kind of like my question before about the, the, compliance audit committee, people with personal agendas, people wanted to promote their business versus the candidates, that type of thing. What's in place for that, please? Or Through the chair. That. There are a couple of considerations that we've embedded throughout the process itself. Within the application form, there is a declaration of impartiality. Within the eligibility requirements of the program itself, there is a quite a, a lengthy list. I believe it's in section four of the policy of whom is eligible and whom is not eligible. So we've really tried to spell that out there. In terms of if you are selected, uh, you will have to sign off on that formal letter of agreement through the review of the application forms. It's going to be done by a small panel of staff. So we'll be hopefully familiar with some of the community members who are interested in the community, as in, interested in this opportunity. Um, as we move forward through the events themselves in the post-event reporting, there's again that declaration and sign off. But the main intent and launch of the program is that an individual should want to participate in this program, irregardless of who is running in the election. It really comes down to the sharing of information and being uh, engaged within that process of communication amongst the community as a whole. So the fact that we've set the application period well in advance of the nomination period, the filing for nominations, we're hoping that that will also disassociate any alliances with any potential candidates because that will all be settled after the applications are, are selected and participants within the program have been determined. Okay. And what do we do? Because I think debates are, are very, very important and, and getting out and meeting with residents, not as important as knocking on doors. And I think candidates absolutely have to do that. But what if we don't get anybody applying? I mean, I, I think they are important to have if, if we get to... Uh, March 
and there hasn't been any applications. Do we have a backup plan where we'll put on at least one debate for each category? If that happens? Through the chair, I'll also defer to Director Cooper to add on, um, but I would say that the way that the program is being proposed right now is that if it is to be approved moving forward and there is no interest in particular groups, the, the, the town would not be necessarily stepping in to fill those gaps and facilitate those events. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's exactly correct. So that is a, a risk that we have with this program, but it was definitely our intention to say uh, we will make this opportunity available if we get uh, some capable applicants and uh, in certain categories, but we have other categories with no events, we will work with the capable and willing applicants to see if they might be willing to take on more. And we've written some language into the governing documents that would allow us to, to try and, and make that happen to the extent that we can. But we do want council to be prepared that the outcome here may be that uh, some categories do not have events in them and that uh, the town, it, it would not be our intention to fill those gaps. Okay. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll absolutely support this. I, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Collier. Are there any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Um, may I please have a mover of the re recommendation? I see Regional Councillor Lee. All in favor? Okay, the policy is approved. Thank you very much. Okay, so that was our uh, last presentation. Item seven on the agenda, closed session. There is none today, so we will move to item eight, the adjournment. May I have a mover? I see Mayor Collier. <laughs> All in favor? Okay, that's it.